send the fleet. Maybe this was a bad idea. Who doesn't love airships? I've seen like 50 different movies with these things in them. Flying around, shooting stuff. Castle in the Sky was cool. I actually don't remember anything else that happened in that movie. I guess it had the iron golems from Minecraft in it. Well here I have a whole game about airships. Airships conquer the skies. This game is all about designing airships, flying airships, managing the logistics of a government system based entirely around airships. There's even a light 4x game mode about managing airships. I'm pretty excited to talk about this game because I've played it for a long time and it really is something special. The setting is simple. Imagine the 1800s. But there's this green substance that is lighter than air called suspendium absolutely everywhere. Sure, dust containing this element is toxic, and in the soil, making most farmland barren and probably causing untold other problems. But what's really important is that this allows a newfound ability to make stuff fly in the air easily, and there are just airships everywhere. Also, there was some form of large world-spanning empire that recently collapsed, leading to turmoil and infighting among the local rulers of its cities. Basically, the West has fallen and billions must die. In airships. You play as one of the many pretender warlords seeking to unite this world through conquest and ascend to the throne as the new emperor. The tactical vehicle combat is what this game is really about, and it goes hard as hell. You can control all kinds of airships, land ships, which are generally tanks or walkers, and static buildings you can place as defenses in real time. The best comparison I can think of is to say this game is similar to High Fleet if the lead developer was Jules Verne. Your vehicles use their weapons automatically, so your main input comes from giving movement orders. Most of a battle will be spent maneuvering your craft around to keep their weapons pointed at the enemy, taking into account the limitations placed on your vehicle's maximum altitude, speed, the range and firing arcs of your weapons, and of course the cooldown between orders that becomes greater on larger vehicles. Besides movement, you can also give smaller orders. If your vehicle is on the opposite side of the map from an enemy building, for example, it would be a good idea to give an aimed fire order to preserve ammunition or to give the order to focus on reloading when your blimp is understaffed because all the lazy liberal air sailors took time off for mortality leave and you need to keep the guns firing. While most of the actual damage dealing comes from your weapons, boarding is also an option to get ahead in combat. Ships with troops can perform sick Pirates of the Caribbean boarding maneuvers and get into brawls with the enemy crew or any guards you find. You can even crew the ship with your troops after and use it in the same battle. It's really satisfying. Despite the simplicity in how you can exert control over battles, the mechanics at play are actually extremely complex. Every crew member in every vehicle is simulated, for example. They all scurry around performing essential tasks like carrying ammunition, operating guns, and putting out fires, and each one can be shot, eaten, gunned down by boarders, or crushed when the room they are standing in collapses. Fires can also start which will quickly spread throughout your airships, especially if you forgot to add a fire point with the water needed to put it out. Worse yet, certain parts of airships are explosive, meaning they will violently blow up when hit and damage surrounding modules, sometimes causing a ship-wide chain reaction of fire, destruction, and dead crew. It's pretty hard to recover from that. The battlescape in this game just feels completely alive. Every vehicle and building is an intricate clock with many moving pieces and nothing is abstracted. Every piece of ammunition needs to be carried manually from storage to the weapon requiring it by a little simulated crew member, which is eye candy that never gets old, but also adds a lot of complexity to designing your vehicles, which we will get more into later. The presentation is also excellent. The graphics, while simple, are incredibly well done and incorporate some beautiful lighting effects. The music and art design also nail the bombastic steampunk theme the whole game is going for. While there are a few boring tracks, there are many more that you will remember for a long time and really add to the mood.
There are a few annoyances though. Weapons don't really do enough damage to feel powerful, especially early on, so battles can feel like waiting around for the chip damage from your muskets and cannons to finally penetrate armor, and start a ship destroying fire or set off an explosion chain reaction. The problem never goes away because even once you unlock imperial cannons and giant rockets, and other large powerful weapons, better armor plating becomes available and you stop seeing the squishy wooden holes that would really get messed up by them. As it is, be prepared to sit on max speed settings for 20 seconds doing nothing if you need to destroy a building with stone walls. Also, the battlescape is extremely small. It isn't always noticeable, but when you have a lot of ships, you can feel really claustrophobic. This compounds with the 2D perspective to make battles feel like massive flying traffic jams. And god forbid you want to use a land ship that can't even move off the ground to get over obstacles. You have about as much of a chance to get where you need to be past other vehicles as you do in New York City at rush hour. What really makes battles interesting is the design system. While you are provided with pre-made blueprints with dubious names, you are heavily encouraged to design your own vehicles, and that really is where the fun of the game is. Ships, land ships, and buildings all need to be assembled out of a variety of individual modules to fulfill essential, non-essential, and completely unnecessary functions. A lot needs to be done to keep an airship happy and healthy. You need lift to get it up off the ground, propulsion to move, supply hatches to... supply, I guess? And even with all these boxes checked, good luck doing anything with the embarrassment you created because it's basically just a flying coffin that doesn't do anything. Even once you add weapons and ammunition and coal and water and crew quarters and guards and sick bays and repair bays and a bridge so you can give orders to the damn thing, you need to remember that your crew actually need to move through your ship to get anything done. So the fact you placed your ammunition a marathon's distance away from your guns will make your ship about as useful in combat as the William D. Porter. Designing may seem easy, but you are always forgetting something. Despite how annoyingly thorough you need to be in order to make a halfway decent design in this game, the editor really does give you a lot of freedom to make some, uh, interesting things. There are lots of weapons to choose from. Embody the energy of an angry farmer by using handheld muskets and rifles to harmlessly pelt the outside of the enemy's reinforced hull. Learn from the anarchists back when they actually did something and use homemade grenades. We got medieval siege weapons here, ballistae and trebuchets, heavy rocks you can drop on the enemy, stuff like that in case you were going for a Flintstones challenge run. For those living after 10,000 BC, there are some proper naval weapons available. Cannons punch through armor, opening up the squishy insides to your low penetration and explosive weapons. These cannons come in normal size, large size, horizontal, vertical, shotgun, and imperial. The imperial cannon may take three years to reload, but it'll probably shoot through one side of the other ship and out the other. If you feel like a hipster, there are also indirect fire cannons like the mortar and heavy bombard. These weapons aren't designed for airships, though, as they suffer accuracy penalties when mounted on or used against them. This makes them only effective on land ships and buildings, but the fact of the matter is that airships are probably the main vehicles you'll be fighting and using yourself. If you enjoy the Israel-Palestine conflict, you can also use rockets. Though they may be bad at hitting intended targets, they sure do cause a lot of irreparable damage. The giant one has a face painted on it. Flamethrowers. You can even use acid spitters that spray monster energy on enemy ship holes, which much like real life is capable of digesting solid metal and human flesh. And that's not even mentioning air mines, bombs, torpedoes, and the numerous sci-fi lasers, railguns, guided missiles, and suspendium implosion device that one-shots any vehicle with a crystal in it. The editor and design process is the strongest aspect of the entire game by far. There's just so much variety in how you can build your vehicles. Every need that your vehicle needs to fulfill has several modules that can do what you need to do. There are so many weapons to mess around with in this game, from handheld muskets, grenades and cannons, to rockets, laser beams, and even deployable airplanes and attack balloons. You can even stick a saw blade or ram on a vehicle and fight with melee, or build designs that utilize harpoons to tie themselves to enemy craft and sandbag them in place. Any insane strategy you can think of is possible to design a vehicle around. Sadly, you aren't given that much incentive to actually use the specialty features. The game only tells you about the functions absolutely essential to the function of your vehicle, and there is no comprehensive tutorial, so it's unlikely you will know to add a repair bay or even the absolutely essential fire point early on if you aren't already familiar. This is a minor issue, however, and the process of putting an airship together is quite intuitive and simple, making learning a breeze, though it is difficult to master, and it will always suck to spend 10 minutes designing a vehicle you think is perfect only for its flaws to be revealed, when it is easily outperformed by a few ships worth half its cost.
Everything I've talked about could be enjoyed in the sandbox design and fight mode of the game, where you can just place down the stuff you made and have your own battles. If you need more than just design and combat in a vacuum, however, you will probably spend most of your time in conquest mode. Conquest is the light 4x game mode of Airships Conquer the Skies, which gives the game a setting, lore, and framing device for the systems I've talked about so far. In Conquest, you play as one of the warlords I mentioned earlier. Start by naming your city and choosing some difficulty settings. You can even get to choose your own coat of arms that can come with unique bonuses. The system for making this coat of arms is actually disturbingly intricate and complex. I think David Stark likes heraldry a little bit too much. And then you are in the game. Conquest isn't all that complicated. You control territories that generate income, which you can spend on buying upgrades and building vehicles to conquer more territory. There's also a research system, and most vehicle modules are locked behind this research, limiting you to the weaker and less advanced options early on. Besides fighting your neighbors for more land, there are also monster nests which can randomly become occupied by anything from pirates to actual monsters. These can be a nice way to face interesting unique encounters or boss fights in the case of the large monsters. Most of them are just big creatures with tentacles that swallow your semen. I guess your crew would actually be called airmen or landmen? But I'm trying to be funny here, alright? Well that was it for the longest time, there was a large and long-awaited diplomacy update that introduced peaceful interaction between empires. Now you can form alliances, make trade pacts, and manage your reputation among other empires which can even allow you to achieve a unique win condition by coordinating yourself emperor. There's even a peaceful use for airships now as you can send them on expeditions to find treasure and knowledge. While this does make conquest mode quite a bit better, it still doesn't make the game civilization, and you will probably still have the most fun conquering your neighbors and not bothering too much with the diplomacy system. Conquest mode is solid and very enjoyable. It can be fun to slowly expand and build up better research, and it provides a well-needed framing device for the combat and design system, along with generating interesting encounters with challenge. So the game feels like a game and not one of those sandbox battle simulators. Even though I guess you could play the abandoned missions mode if you enjoy the same 8 combat encounters over and over again. My main criticism of this game mode is that it does get repetitive very quickly. While monster nests are a unique challenge, fighting other empires early on gets samey as everyone is limited to the same few low-tech modules. Even as text makes you and your foe's arsenal a bit bigger to make battles more engaging, the 4x side of the game is almost completely static. There isn't an endgame crisis, and while there is a changing of error system that can spice up the world map, they often only introduce a few minor stat buffs or decreases, like the game-changing, slightly lower base research costs. Still, Conquest is probably the best way to experience airships, especially if you try to include the other systems as much as you can by designing new vehicles frequently and not auto-resolving any battles. Not very long ago, the game got its first DLC expansion. Based around new hero characters, you can assign as captains to individual ships for bonuses and abilities, or as governors to cities on the conquest map to get some special decisions. There is a very large number of these characters added, and they make battles and conquest a lot more engaging. While captains can boost the capability of the ships you assign them to passively by increasing the speed of crew on board or the accuracy of weapons, their main purpose is through the use of abilities. Every captain has a set of abilities that they can use once per battle to do something like target enemy engines with your weapons or cast a spell to sink a building into the ground. These can be ridiculously overpowered, especially the ones that summon a personal guard of elite boarding troops that require tech levels ahead of what you have, or summon attack aircraft from some kind of pocket dimension. You can put Admiral Mubarak on the shittiest airship possible and just use the troops and craft summoned by his abilities to solo early battles easily. Governors are a lot less interesting. Most of the time, the most they can do is increase the speed that a city can build an airship or some very minor effect like that. All heroes need to be managed in conquest mode, however, as they have a variety of stats. Most heroes have a loyalty stat with character-specific triggers for decreasing or increasing. Some of these can be quite obnoxious and contradict your goals or the wants of other heroes, like having a hero who loses loyalty every time you conquer a city or destroy a monster nest. Some heroes just hate each other and will be constantly losing loyalty as long as the other dares to remain in their presence. For this reason, you should scrutinize every hero carefully before you hire them, as their special ability that adds 0.1% extra reload speed won't be all that helpful if they throw a tantrum and run away to another empire a month after you hire them, because they got mad at you for playing the game as intended. Heroes also generally have an experience meter with a similar fickle requirements to increase, though it will generally never decrease. Filling this meter will upgrade them to a better version of themselves with stronger abilities. 
Sometimes leveling up a hero will even win you the entire game. I do recommend the DLC thoroughly for anyone who wants to play this game, but it is a bit expensive for what it is at $15, as it is an expansion pack for an already small game. Airships Conquer the Skies may be small, but it is incredibly thorough in its execution, and provides everything you could want from a tactical vehicle design and combat game. I think just about anyone could have a good time messing around with it. Even when I don't feel like putting in enough time to play a campaign of Conquest, I will still always find it amusing to build some crazy gimmick vehicle and see if it is viable. And with the amount of freedom and options given to you in this game, often your creativity is rewarded with a fun new tactic to mess around with. If you enjoy brass, sea monsters awkwardly inserted onto land, and designing a coat of arms. Oh, by the way, in the Herald re-editor you can't even choose the set of colors you want completely because they all need to be historically accurate to how actual coats of arms work. Whose idea was this? <laughs> then you will love Airships Conquer the Skies.